All right. <clears throat> I think we are about to go live. I'm just waiting for the the thing to say go. Awesome. Yay. We're here. I think we're live. It's one of those awesome. Okay, here we are. So I've never done this before. I just wanted mm -hmm. to say this is my first time. Well, I, I've done kind of live um, sessions with people. and We do this at our overview experience. When I'm live, I have somebody in a hot seat. But because your question, uh, Natalia, was so good, and it was really coming from a place of like, the thing that I really liked most about it was it was coming from a place of like genuine, like, how do I figure this out? Because it's not like you could, it's your in-law, right? It's not like you could just, you know, cancel. We live in a cancel culture. Oh, you trigger me. I have to walk on eggshells around you. Cancel. And I was very interested with all of the in, like interesting uh, comments. Here's my two cents. And uh, from everybody giving advice, and especially when the word narcissist is used, that it, it brought up so much. And me and my team actually had a conversation about your question. And I was like, fuck this. I, wanna, I want to, I want to uh, change this conversation. I want to help Natalia because Natalia is similar to like most people, especially when we have these labels being thrown around. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for being willing to share your story. Um, uh, because, um, you know, this is a big deal. <laughs> so, oh, <absolutely. laughs> so where do you live? And tell me a little bit about how you heard about how you heard about this community. Where do you live? And give me a 30 second synopsis of what's going on with your in law. Is it your aunt, your mother in law, sister? Like, tell me what's going on. Easy. So I found this um, community about maybe 10 months ago, um, not long after I had a marriage crisis. And um, the in-law is my sister-in-law. Okay. And um, yeah, so basically after my husband and I had a marriage crisis, it was um, based on infidelity, basically, that mm -hmm. I found out about. Um, I had major trauma response from that. And I like you talk about a lot in your videos it was in my physiology like I had PTSD panic attacks I just did not feel safe anywhere um, and that caused reactivity in me of course so I totally. had um, anger complete breakdowns complete you know like it was just a lot of unresolved stuff that came up mm. and um, and basically it was a lot of I guess my you, sister and all kind of has made attended, a lot of you attended you attended you attended one of our events, didn't you? Yeah, I did and, um okay. I've done breath work a few times, yeah. Okay. And did you do the overview experience as well? No, I haven't. Okay, you haven't done that as okay. But just by following along and attending breath work and doing the work, have you noticed things starting to shift within your dynamic? Oh, definitely. And I'm Beautiful. a little bit um I'm really inspired by it and I do a lot of work on my own. And then when I get stuck, I do reach out and I try to find that new perspective and Beautiful. kind of, cause I know that it's conditioning and I'm just like, stop, I need to find truth. So, you know, <laughs> so speaking of the truth, let's, let's see if we can get to the truth with this specific situation. So it's with your sister-in-law and whenever you bring up a conversation and the reason why I'm asking is who it is makes a difference, right? Because we're talking about intergenerational trauma. We're talking about something called emotional enmeshment. And so if, you know, I don't know what your, what your husband's relationship is like with his sister, you know what I mean? So do they have a close relationship? Was there jealousy involved? Was there this sense that you took my brother away from me? You know what I yeah. mean? You never know. Was there anything like that? I'm, my, my intuition is kind of like, ask about that. Was there anything like that? So it's definitely a big, um, you know, a thing that I often consider. Um, they lost their father suddenly 
um, when she was 16 and he was 22. And um, so they I became really, really close. Um, actually, it kind of Went resulted in a lot of isolation and distance. Right. That's um, possible. But yeah, but at the same time, um, I get the feeling that um, my husband became her father figure. Bingo. Okay. So that's very important for us to know in the background because yeah. you can't divorce your. I mean, if you're with your husband and you, you know, I can see how having a unified family front is important to you, but you can't really just, it, the plan isn't to cancel her out of your life, right? That's mm -hmm. not the plan. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what's happening now is that whenever you bring up certain things, she's very sensitive to what you say and gets triggered. So give me a little bit of an example of that so that we can then take it and then I can, I could put you in the hot seat and then we can come up with a solution. Absolutely. So this is already something that I've acknowledged within myself, but I'd love to um, discuss it further. Um, so part of the problem was when we were in our marriage crisis, my husband has felt very isolated for many years. And then he became more isolated because um, there tends to be kind of more, he, he learned a more of an avoidance kind of thing. And this is something mm -hmm. he yeah. himself. Um, as enough. grew up sort of thing. He didn't really understand how to process emotions and things so like that. So he just goes away. He's a little bit of an island. Yep. Got yeah. that. Um, and then it kind of happened again. Um, well, of course it did when we had our marriage crisis and um, he reached out several times to his family and in particular to his sister, but mm -hmm. she kind of put it all up and um, said, well, that's for you to mm -hmm. deal with. And right. I, for my own mental health, I can't, I can't yeah. be a part of it. Right. And my perspective was, look, there's a difference between solving our problem, which he's not asking you to do, and mm -hmm. just holding him in his pain. And he needs right. that and asking right. for that. Um, and sometimes I couldn't give him that because we were in a crisis and I didn't feel safe to do that. So, so, are you, so are you saying that when you bring that up with her, she then rejects that and pushes it away and doesn't want to talk about that and, uh, and, um, and is very confronted so by that? What's, what's the main trigger there, yeah, Natalia? Yeah. Um, for her, I think he, she doesn't like me speaking for him, but okay. my husband really appreciates me helping him mm -hmm. with his language because he's new to this and he spent so many years not knowing how, and I don't, I don't speak for him. I just give him the word sometimes, or I'll just say one word. While you're um, all sitting there together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so basically he's saying I feel alone and isolated and I feel abandoned mm -hmm. and I'll just say at uh, one word in response I'll say look kind of feels like you've been a bit of a part-time family member like got only there when things are good and then got that it. will just like she her, just her, gets her, defensive her. right okay She'll just get yeah <laughs> okay great so sounds to me like there were your your husband doesn't have a great ability to communicate mm. and you want to support your husband. So you are speaking on his behalf to his sister and basically saying you're not there for him. You haven't been there for him. Yeah. And how does she react? She shuts down, runs away. And now because of that, you feel like you're walking on eggshells and you feel like you can't communicate. And so your question was, how do you talk to a narcissist? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Beautiful. So I have, I have to answer this question because here's the thing. I want to, this is what I train all of my students and everybody who does this work. We train them to first answer the question, Number one, we got to get clear. What outcome is it that you're looking for, Natalia? Um, What's the outcome you're really looking for? Because there's a million possibilities. Do you want to be right? Do you want to outcast her from the family? Do you want to shame her and make her feel like a piece of shit for not being there for her brother? There's like a billion things you can do. So before we begin down this track, 
the first thing I'm going to ask you is what outcome is it that Natalia would like to create? And I'm using those words very uh, deliberately. What outcome do I want to create? Because it 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 suppose what does it suppose when I when I when I get you to try that on that question? What outcome do I want to create? What what opens up for you when you try that on? Um, so the outcome that I want to create is I want to be able to speak my authentic voice mm -hmm. in any situation and not feel enmeshed with another person's emotions. At the same time, I want to have some compassion for the person that I'm talking to and have some understanding of you know, um, how I can better support that person so I can Good. build a healthier relationship. Um, and I also would like for my husband to feel heard. So it's a delicate balance. Okay, got <laughs> it. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> All right. So I think we can answer. I, I love what you're saying now because it also shows some level of emotional maturity in a world where most people are like, sorry, cancel them out. You shouldn't have to walk on eggshells around people and all this stuff. This doesn't, when you, when you think in those terms, you're not really understanding the nervous system and human behavior. And that's why I asked you about their relationship in the background, mm -hmm. because I'm going to break it all down for you because it sounds to, and I wrote it down here. It says, I want to speak my authentic voice in any situation and not feel enmeshed with another person's emotions at the same time to have compassion for the person I'm talking to so that I can connect better with them and really be able to help them. So it sounds like you want to take the high road. You don't want to be stuck in this victim narrative, but what's happening is whatever her emotions have become based on what you shared, you're now playing victim to them. Mm. You're now oh, the, you're now playing victim to her reactions. And that's not a great place you want to feel because it's your sister-in-law. You really want connection. I love this conversation, by the way. It is a, it's critical for us to get this. So in order to help you get to that outcome, we have to go back and help you understand the nervous system and understand what causes people to react in the first place. Okay. In an mm -hmm. ideal world, you can turn to her and say, you know what? You weren't there for my, for, for, for my husband. You weren't there for your brother at a time where he needed the, you the most. And, un, and, and unfortunately, uh, you, no, you weren't there at a time when he needed you the most. And all he wants is for you to hear him and see him and understand him. And he wants you there to support for, he wants your emotional support and you're not. And I really want you to, you know, step it up. And ideally you can say that. And then she turns around and says, you know what, Natalia, you're such a great wife. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for standing up for my brother. Mm. Because I clearly wasn't there for him because of my own inability to regulate my emotions. And yeah. whatever you guys were going through was bringing up so much for me that I could not be there for my brother the way that I should have. And I feel truly mm -hmm. humbled and sorry for that. And I'm going to do yeah. everything I can to be there for my brother. Thank you. Tell mm -hmm. me what you need from me. And Natalia, by the way, great work in getting past all of this and being mm -hmm. there for your husband. That is very admirable. I love you as my sister-in-law. My brother is so lucky to have you. Wouldn't okay, that I'm, be great? <laughs> oh my God. That I'm just, just going to change your voice on auto-tune to make it heard. Oh. And then I'm like, oh, good. <laughs> fuck. Wouldn't that be great? If she had, wouldn't it be great, Natalia, if she had the self-awareness to respond to your very humble and, and well-meaning request. Unfortunately, mm. that's not how the universe works. The universe works yeah. in this way. And if, if, if your husband, Matthew, did, did, has this problem with his emotions, 
chances are he came from a family that didn't teach him how to regulate his own emotions. Clearly he yeah. can't because he goes and becomes an island. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is because that's his responsibility to learn and regulate, and he hasn't chosen to learn how to regulate his emotions so that he can then speak from his own heart, Luckily, what happened in a perfect world, Natalia would be able to also go, you know what, sweetheart, it's clear that you're having some emotions about this and you're still wounded about your sister not being there. This is the time for you to heal those wounds so you can step up and do that because I'm not your savior. I'm not here to rescue you. I'm not here to fix your problem because essentially that's your work to do. And if I were to get involved, there runs a risk because you have the same family and you had the same upbringing that your sister as well would be extremely unable to regulate herself, get defensive because the last thing an ego wants, the biggest mm -hmm. fear to our ego is what? What do you think is the biggest fear to our ego? change that's one of them because there's fear but even worse oh gosh oh, i don't know just being questioned even being a bad person oh being, yeah being a <laughs> being, a, being, a, being, a, being a shit mom being a shit sister being a shit dad being a shit son being a bad person being bad is the biggest threat to my ego so when you, when you give me feedback done in a way that's intolerable and not done with compassion, my ego defenses are going to go up and either I'm going to attack you back and say, fuck you, which is probably what she's thinking when, yeah. when you said that to her. Yeah. Okay. Or I'm going to go the other way, which is I'm going to shut down as you say in your post, lick my wounds and avoid being around you because looking at your face mm. makes me feel like I'm bad. It's a reminder that I'm bad. I don't have any understanding coming from you. Does this make sense? Mm. Yeah, it does. And I think so what opens like, up for you with this conversation? Um, I guess, I guess like, I think the ego is really interesting in that way because um, I feel like in these conversations, you know, that first part that you said with the, oh, you're a great mm -hmm. sister. I can understand you. I can see what that's and all of that. And I'll point those things out. I'll be like, I, can, I, I feel like I do understand why you're sensitive to this and mm -hmm. you, or I'll just, I'll ask questions, but it's mm -hmm. just no, nothing, no, like exactly. literally nothing. Right. And it, it came from, <clears throat> yeah, so it's not just the ego okay. attack, but also the, like, just, you know, there's no, coming there's, from a place of inquiry, like coming from, yeah, yeah. If I sense that you're attacking me, then yeah. I'm already going to have my defenses up. Hmm. Okay. That's just how the nervous system works. If you threaten my badness, the hmm. thought of me being a bad brother, sister, husband, wife, mom, dad, whoever, I'm going to get defensive. And yeah. that's what's happening. So now that I've given you the background of human mm -hmm. behavior 101, when it comes yeah. to interpersonal trauma passed down from generation to generation, we can understand number one, when you're trying to jump in and become the hero, you're yeah. trying to become your husband's hero, yeah. Trying to become yeah. the hero to the become the hero to the dynamic between the two of them. I know I'm in I'm evolved. I'm gonna be the hero. Don't yeah. be surprised if <laughs> number one, you can't rescue them, and number two, the hero usually ends up becoming the perpetrator. Oh yeah. yeah so yeah. now you you've become yeah. the perpetrator in the drama triangle. Hmm. Yeah. Right. And then she turns around and perpetrates back to you with critical feedback or shutting down, which is another form of perpetration. If I stonewall yeah. you, I perpetrate you. And now you're the victim to her yeah. perpetration. Now you come back and then you call her a narcissist. Yeah. 
And now you perpetrate yeah. back. And then now she's going to go, well, fuck you. You're a narcissist. And then she perpetrates back. And now it's a, it's a race to see who can be the victim. Now, yeah, yep. now that we have Definitely. an understanding of how it's working, the real question then becomes, how do we transform? And in the overview experience, Natalia, I teach you two fundamental processes that help you dismantle this drama triangle between you two and yep. then come up with an actual solution so that you can have the outcome, which is to speak your authentic voice in any situation and not feel enmeshed with her emotions at the same time having compassion for her and to connect better. Yep. You ready? You ready? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the first thing you want to do is, uh, you, anybody who's watching, you can write this down, take notes. You want to spot the transference. Okay. What does I mean? Every relationship, when you're triggered, it's not about what it's about. Okay. She is, what is she doing? She's dismissing you. She's invalidating you. She's not hearing you. What's the feeling that's coming up when she does that inside of you? Just ignore what's happening. Let's pretend she doesn't exist. What's happening inside Natalia's body when she doesn't hear you, dismisses you, invalidates your request to mm -hmm. step it up as a sister? Um, I think more the request to connect is more the thing. Okay, um, so so what so, does so she, you request to connect and she rejects it? What yeah. what happens? What does Natalia feel in her body when that happens? I feel I feel unimportant. Mm. I don't rejected, feel, um, unimportant. Yeah. yeah. And what's the yeah. I am statement, which is the self abandoning statement? Every time we're triggered, we make an unconscious self abandoning statement in that moment of trigger? What's the I am statement that Natalia is making about herself when she dis when she's dismissed by her sister-in-law? I, I am. I'm unworthy. Perfect. I'm unworthy. I want you to now just feel that for a moment. Mm -hmm. This is the difficult part. You wanted help. You wanted, you wanted healing on this. This is how we do it. And this comes from understanding neuroscience. This comes from doing personal development. I want you to now just feel the unworthiness feeling in your body when that happens. I want you to put your hand over it where you feel that the most. Perfect. I want you to sit with that for a moment. The I'm not worthy feeling. I'm unworthy feeling. This isn't new for you, is it? This isn't new, is it? <laughs> You're like, no. No, can you go back? Not, can you go back to the earliest memory where Natalia was a little girl and felt unworthy, dismissed, not heard, not seen? What is, in other words, what is your sister-in-law bringing up within you? I remember having big emotions and being abandoned. Mm, beautiful. How old are you in that moment? Very small. I'm probably only about five or six years old. Beautiful. Natalia, I'm going to now guide you with your permission into the body of that little five-year-old and six-year-old. How old are your kids, by the way? He's only one. <laughs> okay, perfect. Beautiful little toddler I want you to just feel that little five six-year-old self feeling abandoned and and unworthy when big emotions were happening that you weren't acknowledged seen and I want you to give yourself permission to feel that really feel that what was going on around you and what was really happening there You're doing great, by the way. My feelings were always made about 
my father always made it about him. <laughs> mm. Beautiful. I really want you to just feel that how painful that was. <sighs> What's if you could if you could be that little girl feeling what she felt, what is it that she really wanted to say? What did you want to say? If you could just scream it or just cry it out, what is it that she was feeling that she just really wanted to say in that moment? I'm allowed to feel. <laughs> yeah, let yourself just give yourself permission to feel that unworthiness feeling. So you're you were having big emotions and your dad was doing what? Dismissing them, telling you not to feel them, shushing them. Good. I want you to feel that unworthy feeling for a moment. You can put your hand down. Just feel it as that little girl Feel that unworthiness. Let your whole body, give yourself full permission to feel unworthy. So totally okay to feel unworthy in that moment. It's a really painful feeling. It's okay to feel it right now. Now, at the exact same time, I want you to get curious what was having you feel worthy in that exact moment? We're not able to experience without contrast. So I'm getting you present in your body to where the other side of that story was. In that exact moment, what was having you feel totally worthy as a five-year-old in that moment? Did your mother always validate you? In that exact moment, could you see your mind going to any place of where you felt validated in that moment? Just stay with it. Get curious. Where was your feeling of validation coming from? Where's that feeling of worthiness actually coming from? I would always go back to the way I looked or my physical or my material things. Okay. Without making that wrong, without having a judgment on it, can you, real, can you acknowledge your worthiness in that department that you were given? Was it from your dad? Um, from my mom and my dad. And Perfect. I felt, yeah. Really let that in for a moment. It's okay to feel your worthiness from the physical too. Even though you have a judgment on, I want you to really give permission to feel the worthiness that was happening in that exact moment. Perfect. Now, can you see any worthiness in your father's reaction to you? and your emotions. Where was the worthiness in his reaction to you? Because you made up a story that you're not worthy. Can you see your worthiness in the reaction itself? Tell me about it. I can feel that he was trying to fix mm. and it wasn't to harm. It, it was wasn't to harm. He was just trying to solve it because he didn't know what to do about he didn't know how to what to do about his emotions when you were having emotions. Is that not right? Is it yeah. fair to say he was enmeshed with you? Oh, a million percent fair. Does that mean, <laughs> does that mean you're not worthy? No. What does it mean? It means he wasn't able to process. That's right. Does it mean you're unworthy? No. What does it actually mean? Um, it means that you were worthy. Yeah, I am. Yeah. Can you see that if you're enmeshed with your child's emotions, it doesn't mean they're unworthy. It means the exact fucking opposite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can yeah. you close your eyes in that exact moment and really let that in? Mm. 
can you just let in the worthiness of a little girl whose father did not know how to regulate her emotions and he made it about him and his own failure of being a shit dad? <laughs> can you see the worthiness of that? Yeah, I can. Beautiful. Yeah. And what did having a dad who didn't really, you can even open your eyes. What did having a dad who didn't know what to do about his daughter's emotions and made, made it about him, even though that was painful and invalidating, what traits, what, how did you have to adapt to that? How did you get to adapt to that? What, what creative ways did you come up with to adapt to that that are your superpowers right now? <laughs> you know where this is going, don't you? <laughs> Sorry. I've maybe done I, this one or two times. Um, I became his parent. <laughs> and even though that was parent, even though that was painful and it quote unquote shouldn't have happened, yeah. how did that serve you? Were you able to learn how to get what you wanted? Um relatively speaking yeah. yeah definitely it helped me to oh I, I guess I don't know yeah receive love in the way that I wanted to you or could not create, wanted to but yeah yeah and what by helping yeah <laughs> what would you say your superpower is what would you say the number one thing about you that you love, that you would never want anyone to take away? What would you say that is? Oh, gosh. I think it was and is probably. I don't know. I think my, I think, oh, gosh, it's kind of a, not so much a superpower because I have to be careful of it. It's. Mm -hmm. That's how superpowers work. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Um, there I think it's literally that it's my emotions my my um ability to feel myself i think your ability to feel that's yourself that's yeah that. if da if dad was always there to rescue you and to see you would you have this skill <laughs> no i wouldn't beautiful beautiful yeah. now <laughs> So the first step that we did, can you see, see and appreciate and love the little girl who became this amazing felt sense individual because of the experience of a dad that was completely, you know, enmeshed with his daughter's emotions, which most are because nobody's really mm -hmm. studied this. See, what we're doing right now is helping break that cycle by giving that little girl the acknowledgement that she was wanting from dad. Can you acknowledge that little girl oh, for, for feeling so invalidated and unworthy mm -hmm. that she became a master of feeling and plus a million other superpowers that you that I'm sure you have that we don't really have the time to go over, but I just really wanted to spot that. So that's step one. When you yeah. could see that your sister-in-law is invalidation it's not about her that's not what's triggering you the most it's because it's bringing up an old unresolved attachment wound with dad that's step one to help you get to this level to get to this mm -hmm. outcome to speak your authentic voice and not feel enmeshed with other person's emotions you got to go and look in and see and where that cycle was created and now to do some reparenting work with your five-year-old self, which you've done in our programs and you've learned. We also have a um, um, reparenting um, and inner child meditation bundle that you can mm -hmm. use to then reconnect with that five-year-old. And so this is ongoing work. So this is what you would do is spend time with that five-year-old and really validate her the way that, what what is it that you wanted dad to say to her? What is it that you wish that she, she heard from dad that you can actually give to her talking to mm -hmm. her as though it's your own daughter what could you say to her if you could just kind of look into her eyes what was she wearing in that scene ah uh, she was uh, like a little t-shirt and shorts Perfect. very athletic if yep. you can look into her eyes right now what is it that you want to say to her 
tell me the because you're a mom right now and you have that big open heart as a mom does if you could see a little five-year-old version of you who was going through what she was going through just tune in for a moment with her mm. what is it that she needs to hear from you what what advice would you give to her how you feel is important and I can see you and I can hear you. Mm. That's, yeah. And what would you say to her about her dad? Mm. Tell me what you would say to her because now she's looking at you and saying, you know, why, why can't, why can't dad see me? What, what do I do about dad? I feel unworthy right now. What would you say to her about that? I think I'd tell her that those feelings that it's okay to feel the feelings that she's having of unworthiness because mm -hmm. everyone feels like that sometimes. Okay. And it's you to, to find that worthiness. Okay. Not, but what would you say to her about her dad, about the challenge she's having with dad? What specifically would you give her advice to her about dad? Knowing what you know now, knowing about that feeling of unworthiness and the fact that dad doesn't see her, what, you know, what's really, you know, what advice or guidance would you give her with this problem she's having with dad? I think I would let her know that what's happening will help you develop a superpower <laughs> and that it's worthwhile and I'm a bit stuck on that one to be honest okay. yeah uh, okay yeah. Hmm. and yeah. basically in 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 essence can you see that you can let her know that dad loves you very much he just doesn't know how to handle his own emotions yeah, absolutely. And it yeah, doesn't yeah. and it doesn't mean and it doesn't mean say that again. It's not about you. It's not about you, little girl. It's about him. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, perfect. So let's remember that. Yeah. Those are some wise words right there. All right. Now number two. Number two is to spot the projection. How do you mm -hmm. talk to a narcissist? Well, first thing to do is to throw away the label. Because if I label mm -hmm. you a narcissist, then here's what happens. I mm -hmm. put on these goggles now. Now, I, yeah. everything that I look at you is with the lens of you're a narcissist. And guess yeah. what? If I watch you for a week with these goggles, guess what I'm going to find? Yeah, you're only going to see. I'm the just going to find evidence after evidence that Natalia is a narcissist. You, you'd say yeah. the same about me. Literally, yeah. you, could, you could find that about anyone. So that's, that might absolve you from the responsibility. The people who love to point fingers and, and label other people, they do so because it's easier to play the victim to a narcissist. Yeah, yeah. It's so much easier because then it, taking responsibility for your part of the dance is far too uh, emotionally laborious <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. and it just, it's easier to blame the other person. Cause then I don't have to take any responsibility. I can just call you a narcissist and now I could kick back my, <laughs> my feet and go, fuck it. I don't have to try. She's a goddamn narcissist. Yeah. It's completely what you said before in that, like, you know, you project and then you project and you do this because okay. I felt like I was seen through binoculars. And so I was like, I'm going to see you through binoculars then. <laughs> Perfect. Which doesn't get us the outcome that you're looking for. No, in the no. world today where everybody's in conflict, this is the only conversation that healing is the net result that I'm interested in. So check this out. The next part is the difficult part and not too many people can do this. That's why I say, I think the work that we do is for the 10%, 90% of people are unwilling to face this next question. Part two is spot the projection. If, if here it is, the fundamental principle based on Carl Jung's work is that if I see something in you that triggers me, like you're a narcissist, mm -hmm. then basically what that means is 
I'm triggered by my own shadow. Deep down, I have a narcissist, narcissistic parts of myself that I'm not willing to face, that I see it in you so that I can absolve myself from the responsibility of owning, and then I can blame it on you, but actually I'm looking at a reflection. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So here's the question that I'm gonna <laughs> ask you is, where in this moment, what is a narcissist? Well, it's somebody who lacks empathy. Yeah. It's somebody who makes it about them. Yeah. So where are you? This is the question you're going to ask. And most people, by the way, they can't do this question. Mm -hmm. It's just unavailable. Their egos are blocking. So you, I can yeah. tell you're more self-aware than that. Who sees me? Where am I being a narcissist? I see myself as being narcissistic in this Where? Way. I, I think I was narcissistic when I made my husband's infidelity about me even. And so- um, That's one, even though okay. It was very painful, right. Even if it was, yeah. And where and, else? Right. Okay, so you made a perfect example. Perfect example when your husband had an, had an act, and by the way, this happens to everyone, immediately you feel betrayed, abandoned, and it's all about you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right? And it's about I'm not enough. I'm not this. I'm not I'm that. not. I'm, I'm not. not I'm not. Like, it's, it's not about what's going on in this dynamic. What was you, what did you feel that you were missing that you didn't have access to with me? How can we create that here? How can we both take responsibility to ensure intimacy? No, no, no. Right away, it's like, poor me. I'm a victim to this. So you made it about you. Oh, okay. yeah, I did. And so, I, just, to, just to be clear, I am past that massive. I can totally tell. Now. I can totally <laughs> tell. You wouldn't be able to have this conversation and be laughing about it if that weren't true. So watch this. Here's what I'd like to invite you to do. Can you connect with the narcissistic part of you that did that and behaved that way? Yeah. Let's look at her. Mm. What was going on for her? What was she feeling? Um, I might be loved, but I'm not loved enough. I'm not might, lovable. I'm not, I might be the one, but I'm one is not enough. I'm not right. Be. I'm not enough. Perfect. I'm, yeah. So here's what I'd like for you to, I want you to close your eyes and really go into the feeling of I'm not enough that came up. I really want you to get into the body sense feeling when that all happened of I'm not enough because now you have the root cause of narcissism. I want you to really own it and give yourself full permission to feel I'm not enough. Give yourself full permission. This is a very difficult thing, but I want you to really go deep and allow any emotions that came up during that time, the abandonment, I'm not enough, I'm attacked, I'm betrayed, I'm abandoned, I'm not enough, really allow those to come up. You really got to allow and admit it. Ah, in that moment, what was she afraid of the most? What were you afraid of the most? What were you fearing the most? That that would be the truth. That being enough was the truth and not just a feeling. And the fear of not being loved. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. Can you give yourself permission to have that fear of not being loved? Really let that in. That is not your fault to feel that way. It's totally okay to feel that fear and allowing it to come up. Now that you feel that, 
at that exact moment, where did you feel the complete worthiness at that same time when it all came out? Where did you feel the lovability and worthiness? Did he step up for you? Did he? Yeah, he did. Tell me how, tell me where you felt that absolute lovability. In that moment of. Uh, in my. I felt it. Based on his behavior, how was, what was he doing that had you feeling lovable when that happened? Stayed and even when I raged, he stayed and he held me. And even when I was at my worst, he still held, held me. I want you to really let that lovability in. Let that in. Beautiful. Let yourself feel the lovability that you had in that moment of sheer unlovableness. Can you see that you had absolute evidence had you felt that intense lovability from him before that <laughs> can you see that it might have taken a wake-up call for both of you not to justify infidelity but let's say these things happen every single day it's either a way out of the relation it's either a way out of the relationship or a way back in can you see that that was the wake-up call the two of you needed to really get back into alignment with your relationship? Oh, absolutely. I'm so grateful for it. Beautiful. Great work. Now, check this out. Open your eyes for me. Really great work, Natalia. Now, understanding the mechanism of your narcissism, what was hidden beneath it? Fear. Fear of what? Fear of being unlovable. Bingo. Mm. So <laughs> let's go back to your original question. How do you talk to a, how do you talk to a narcissist now? Now understanding what the process we just went through. Let me recap. Spotting the transference, which was what she, the trigger she was bringing up by not hearing you. First of all, let's recap. You trying to be the hero and rescue your husband who's got to be his own fucking hero and do his own work. He can't speak for himself. So you got to get in there and mix it up in between him and his sister. His sister feels what? Defensive and then unwilling to hear your side and acts narcissistic, which causes you to then feel triggered and feel unworthy, which was just like when? You were five years old as a little girl, feeling that from dad, which turned out to be a story that yeah. wasn't necessarily true. Yeah, absolutely. Boom. We've <laughs> taken care of the, the, the we've taken care of the, um, the transference to dad, which was going on in that moment. And now we're spotting the projection. You're mm -hmm. pointing a finger and saying, sister-in-law is a narcissist. Mm -hmm. Just like who? just like me when well when that tragedy happened and i made everything about me yeah and now what we did was we went and we empathized with the you that was being a narcissist and discovered yeah. what was she feeling yeah what was she yeah, feeling? fear of being unlovable or bad or perfect know, like not good enough perfect now taking this wisdom you just described discovered all from inside of you. I didn't tell you anything. You came up with it yourself. Yeah. Now bringing that same wisdom with what you said to her, what was it mm -hmm. that you, what was the advice you were giving? What was the advice you were giving to yourself about I, your dad? Oh, um, about my dad, mm -hmm. that you are lovable. And this is how I, sh he, he loves you. He just doesn't know how to. Um, regulate his emotions right and it's not about it's not about you perfect yeah. take that same wisdom now how do you talk to a narcissist how do you talk to your sister-in-law with i feel statements so mm -hmm. i feel you know this and that like whatever i'm feeling and it's not about you it's about it's about 
me. It's, you know, and I can ask, I can still request, I can still request and say, you know, I would like to feel more connected to you through. Perfect. You know, perfect. Thing. Yeah. That's great. But not be the yes or no, just, well, well, just here's, says no. Here's what I would suggest if you, if you really want to take it, because, you know, we're just, you know, you, you haven't gone into our courses to really understand these communication patterns and how to reframe things. But how about starting with empathy? When she's being a narcissist, mm -hmm. when you're telling her, telling her to step up as a, as a, as a sister, mm -hmm. and she, first of all, why does it, why does her reaction now make sense? Um, because it was an attack on the ego and the ego is, um, afraid and totally, of not yeah. totally. Number one, you were trying to rescue your, your husband. That's his job to speak yeah. for himself. Number one. Yeah. So if I were you, I would stay out of it because mm -hmm. it's not your job and, and allow, if you want that coherent kind of relationship, then empower your husband stop seeing him so small and empower him to step up and speak and not have yeah. to get in the way of those two. That's the first mm -hmm. one. Number two, yeah. when you said that you're actually attacking her, sis, her, you're attacking her. She's making it about who? About me. No, she's oh, not making she's it. You're, making it, you're about making it about you. Yeah. You're uh, making yeah, it making, about you. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> she's yeah. making it about her. She's yes. not which is normal for a, a, somebody who is triggered, has their own abandonment wounds as your, as your husband and her definitely have from their upbringing. So they don't have the capacity to have these conversations to be emotion, like adult, emotionally adult. They're emotionally mm -hmm. five years old. They became, yeah. you were five years old and she was five years old as well. Mm, yep. So whose work is it to do the growing up? Whose work is it to have empathy? Oh, it's my, my job. Perfect. So if you could empathize with her narcissistic ways when she's being that narcissistic and you're spotting that behavior in her, what is she actually saying based on, what is she actually afraid of based on what you discovered about your own narcissistic self? Can you repeat the question, sorry? When she's behaving like a narcissist, yeah. what is she actually afraid of? Not being Bingo. loved. Bingo. Yeah. So instead of playing victim to a narcissist, what's a yeah. wiser framework to take on if you truly have the outcome, as you said, to not be enmeshed with her emotions and have compassion for her to connect better? What is the most critical understanding you must have in order to make that outcome happen? Um, that we aren't different. We're the same. That that it's not, she's not a narcissist. And it, when you read it out, I was like, did I really write that? Um, <laughs> yes, believe me, um, I hear that fucking shit every week. Yeah. <laughs> it's That's why I wanted my, to have this conversation. It was Yes. Yeah, <laughs> it was my miscommunication of I meant, I guess I meant the narcissist. Because totally, totally. It, and, I know. And, and yes, the thing yeah, is, here, here's the secret. We're all, we're all covert narcissists, Natalia. Yeah. The second yeah. we get triggered and we make it about us. Yeah. <laughs> the second we get triggered, we make everything about us. We invalidate the other person. And yeah. we, in that moment, become covert narcissists. We all are the same. So it's yeah. wiser to walk in knowing that her, when she's behaving that way and is unable to regulate her emotions, yeah. doesn't mean she doesn't love you or you're bad. You're making that about you. She's afraid of being what? She's afraid of what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of um, not being lovable and being bad. And yeah. Bingo. And in helping her and in Helping her, nurse that part of her. I'm also helping that part of myself Thank because you. I'm to my narcissist too. 
empathy is the only healer. The problem is we point you just fingers. Best friends. <laughs> you could. <laughs> Yes. In fact, what I'd like for you to do is to call her and say, you know what, I've been labeling you, not realizing that I didn't take the time to actually empathize with, you know, how what I'm saying to you is quite confronting. Basically, I'm accusing you of being a bad sister. And that's not, that's not fair for me to do. Because that's between you and your husband, be, be, between you and your brother. That's between you and your brother. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. So that's your homework, my dear, is to have that conversation. So tell me in this conversation, thank you, by the way. I want to say thanks for bringing up that. Um, what came up for you in this conversation? What, oh, what, um, what landed? What, what did you learn in this for your question? Let me, let me ask the question again, OK? I'm going to, I'm going to go over it one more time so that you can uh, understand it. Here yeah. it is. All right. How to talk to a narcissist just had this question from a member of the, okay. Looking for support. How do you communicate with someone who seems to be triggered by everything you say? I'm having trouble with an in-law that gets offended by so many things I say to the point of someone else can say the exact same thing, but it doesn't bother her until I say it. Can you understand why now? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Then she shuts down and needs time and space to lick her wounds. It can be surprising to me the things she gets upset about. I realize it's about her and has very, very little to do with me, but I'm about to make it, <laughs> but I'm about to make it about me right now. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> I kind of feel a bit suffocated now, making it about me. <laughs> When I'm around her, like speaking truthfully and with my authentic voice causes her harm. I also know her feelings aren't my responsibility, but I'm about to take responsibility for them, uh, but would like to have a better relationship with her down the track. I don't want to make judgments, but I'm about to make judgments. <laughs> but my hubby and I yes. have been observing <laughs> quite a few narcissists. I don't want to make judgments, but I'm about to judge her for being a narcissist. I love this. My, old, my other favorite yeah. is, I fucking hate this person. They're this, they're narcissists, narcissists, da, 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 da. But, but I'm not again, judging. <laughs> but, 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 but I totally wish them well, and I wish them all the peace and love, but I'm never going to talk to them again. Why do yeah. we do that? I kind of figured out why we do that. Because what's the biggest threat to our ego is being what? Yeah. A no, bad person. Right. Being yeah, a bad person. So I'm going to say something that's really, really like attacking, but I don't want to be perceived by others as a bad person. I don't want to make judgments or anything, but I'm about to make a judgment. Those are my favorite questions where I yeah. just, I sometimes I'm hate- I'm laugh at my expense. <laughs> no, but the whole point Not of this extent, is that <laughs> our egos are funny. It's wiser for us yeah. to have a playful, funny, uh, relationship with our egos because they're always going to create stories. It's always there. And what I love teaching people is to have a playful, fun relationship with our ego because we're all human. But if you want to heal relationships, which is what I stand for, had become trigger proof, we take ownership from the projection, the transference, and then return back to that family member and say, hey, look, we all have our own wounds. This is my, this is, this is what came up for me and um, how I was inauthentic with it. And my vulnerability in doing so opens the space for the other person to feel safe and feel vulnerable possibly. But I don't care. I'm responsible for my own work. I'm not here to fix other people unless they pay me for it. That's, that's, yeah. that's a, that is a, that is a, um, a, a really good um, uh, rule of thumb. Don't fix or rescue unless somebody's paying, paying you for it because yeah. <laughs> helping pay for it. Because at the end of the day, nobody can fix and rescue you but you, number one. Yeah. And number two, it's wiser to just take responsibility because even when they're paying you for it, they'll still be resistant. <laughs> yep. yeah. So thank you so much. Um, this 
method, this technique is something that I love teaching. We're having our overview experience coming up in a few days, like later this week. So there'll be a link below. I do encourage you to jump in and really deepen because it's really about understanding how to adapt our nervous systems to become like water, to become adaptable, to become trigger proof, not trigger less, because you're entitled to your triggers, but you didn't realize this was all dad stuff coming up and you didn't realize this was all a reflection. And yeah. so the way that you heal this and create safety in your environment is to create safety internally with your own environment, then come back and empathize with everyone around you. Yeah. And it's really interesting. You asked me before what things came up. And I think one of the things that came up the most was when you asked me to think of myself as not enough, the, the voice that was telling me I'm enough was so loud because of the work that I've done with you that it was so hard to get myself into that space. Beautiful. So, That's a good sign. Yeah. Your nervous system mm, is changing. Uh, so yeah, the work is never done. And also, uh, being able to... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, sweetie. Uh, uh, I just, and also I just, um, you know, when we were laughing about it, it was really nice to acknowledge that I could just be like, oh yeah, I messed up. That was a silly comment, but not feel like a mess. Like, no, just yeah. be like, oh, it's okay. I'm not a mess. <laughs> we're just, <laughs> we're just <laughs> unconscious 95% of the time. Yeah. So this is consciousness work. And if we can kind of get to a playful, laughable kind of relationship with our own egos, mm. that's when we start to have compassion towards ourselves. And when we have yeah. compassion towards ourselves, we can then translate to other people and to our families. And so we can literally break the cycle of intergenerational trauma. The people who show up at our workshops and our events are people who choose to be cycle breakers because it's a lot mm. easier for you to point the finger, label her a narcissist, cancel her out of your life and say, fuck you. And then your world gets smaller and smaller. You're a victim to other what? people's emotions, or you can do the work, what you just did there, get some assistance. There's blind spots you couldn't see and get somebody oh. who's qualified and special, specialized in helping you in this and go in and heal your attachment wounds yourself so you can emerge powerful, divine feminine leader that you are yeah that's who i'm interested in thank talking to you. big love to you thank you so oh, much absolutely. thanks natalia do thanks just, so much do i just what do i just exit yeah we're just gonna i'm just gonna oh, end it right you. here all Take right care. Thanks. bye bye and if you are wanting to learn more follow the link in the comment section and jump in and join us at the overview experience where you can actually learn how to do this with you. See you at the next perfect time.